Hey guys, good afternoon and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 Mumbai newsroom. I'm Pavitra, with me is Sonal and you are tuned into Mutual Fund Corner. Now, you know, we have been talking about all-time high levels on the Nifty. I know we evaded that level by literally one point, right? But the question we want to ask today is how do you go about thinking about your investments at a time like this? If you're someone that's getting into the market now, you're trying to create a mutual fund portfolio from scratch, does the approach really change with the market at elevated levels? So, Sonal, I think that's important because there are a lot of people who want to get in even right now and they wonder, you know, how they should alter their strategy. Maybe. Lots to discuss, right? So, <laughs> let's take that forward now and let's welcome Prableen Bajpai, the founder at Philfix Research and Analytics to talk about creating a strong and a balanced portfolio, especially when we are so close to record highs. And that's exactly the first question, Prableen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are pretty much at all-time highs. How does someone get into the market design, get, getting into the market, design their strategy? Is there something you would do differently considering we are so close here? Hi, Sonal. Hi, Pavitra. Absolutely. I think this is such a tricky, I mean, interesting question, but, you know, tricky one to answer. So I think let's first establish that, you know, it is absolutely uh, impossible and very, very hard to time the markets. And markets are so typically belong to those investors who participate and who are present. So definitely uh, entering the markets, even at elevated levels, is fine. But uh, the strategy can definitely vary depending on the levels at which uh, one is looking to participate. Having said that, you know, if you look at the calendar year returns of Nifty over the years, from 2000, we'll see that, you know, it's only four calendar years when Nifty has actually given negative returns. So it sounds, you know, like a very strong case for investment in the equity markets. And it does seem like that, you know, all investments would, done, uh, would have done phenomenally well. Uh, but I think uh, markets, you know, go through their own uh, draw, uh, drawdowns. And I think it's important to look, uh, you know, what happens if we are actually caught up in one of those. And uh, Nifty has seen big falls of as high as 60% uh, that was during the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis, followed by what we saw during the, you know, dot-com bubble, then COVID, uh, that's almost a 40% fall in Nifty. So we have these four, five periods which have actually witnessed where markets have seen huge corrections. And I think going back historically can actually give us some ideas you know, what kind of a strategy does one, uh, you know, can deploy in such times? So the first, uh, you know, data point which I want to discuss here, Sonal, is, you know, how does or how do these markets actually affect a SIP investor? So I'm going to uh, pick up 2008, 2009. That's the period I'm going to start with. And let's say that at 2008 highs in January, somebody started with an SIP. And that was the time when Nifty uh, had hit about 6,300 levels. And if the person stayed invested uh, right from January, was doing SIPs until now, the returns for the investor would be somewhere about XIR or of 11%, 11.5%. Uh, the same person, if started investing in October, November of 2008, when the markets had hit a low and Nifty was at 2,500 levels, would have also made around the same level returns if he or she was an SIP investor. And uh, something similar is seen for the other periods of drawdown as well, that returns are somewhere between 11 to 13 percent, depending on the time or, you know, of the entry point in the markets. And these are the periods when we are seeing, you know, uh, highs and then very sharp corrections and the lows in the markets. So if you're a long term investor, we can, I think, conclude that the point of entry will not matter your returns too much. And this is, you know, a longish period we are looking at. Uh, even if you look at the returns from 2020, January onwards, actually, the XIRR is very good because if the time period is lesser, the XIRR tends to go up. Mm. But so now let's just look at the data from a five-year SIP point of view. And that is where, you know, we see a change. If somebody invested in 2008 and was only investing for five years, the person would have made about 9.5, 10% returns. Uh, but somebody who had invested in 2004 and ended his or her five years in January of 2009 would have not made returns. You know, it would have been flat. And he or she would have had to wait for another eight, nine months uh, to make good returns, and that would have taken his or her returns up to 18%. So um, I think uh, nothing much to worry if you're an SIP investor. I think a bit of concern for those who are looking to invest in one go, and that is where I think the levels do matter. 
uh, because if we see, uh, you know, a lump sum investment done in January of 2008, so what we'll see that even five years later, in January of 2013, the returns were actually negative 4% if it was a one-time investment. And that's because once the markets recovered from 2008-9, again, we saw the markets dipping in 2011 by about 25%. So uh, as far as the lump sum investments are concerned, the experience will really vary depending on when you invested and it's uh, the one-time investment. And till today, if that investment was held, it would give about 8% returns, which is not very high and uh, not too bad also, but yeah, considering the expectations from equity, I would say not great. Uh, the best active fund would have given about 10.5% and the worst till now would have given about 3.5%. So as far as the lumps of investments go, uh, the experience can be very varied if you look at 2020. Till now, we've uh, seen an annualized return of 13% in just three years. So I think from the point of entry, and then what follows, how strong is the rally after that correction also really matters a lot. And uh, so for SI, uh, for lump sum investors, I think it's good to take a staggered approach because if somebody who started in 2008 had done that and invested over a six month period, his or her investments would have been 14% in absolute returns, uh, you know, as compared to that minus four in the next five year period. And if the STP was done over a one year period, the returns would have been up by 33%. So I think in conclusion, Sonal, what I would like to say is that, you know, as investors, uh, somebody who's doing SIP should continue, should not worry about the market levels. Somebody who's looking to park a lump sum should, I think at levels where you know that it's an all time high, can take a standard approach, park something in one go. And I think the remaining can be done on a weekly basis or STP or something can be just kept in the switch can be done if in case we see volatility and some sort of a dip in the markets. Okay, that's very, very helpful data probably to really highlight how the, you know, returns have looked and how it's different when you consider, uh, you know, an SIP approach versus the slum sum approach. So I'm sure that will help all of our viewers a lot. But now that you, you know, you started by saying that the people who make money in this market are people who participate, right? So you have to still get into the market, even if you're doing an SIP, even if you're getting in small, um, if someone is trying to create an MF portfolio from scratch at a time like this, what do you consider? This is just advice to anyone who's looking to get into mutual funds. I think, Pavitra, it's so important to know where you want to go, right? So if I have to go to the market near my house, I can just walk. So if I have to park my money for a year, year and a half, I would not even look at equities. If I am doing something, let's say for my child, where the goal is 10 years away, uh, a fixed income investment will not be able to meet my financial goals because with the education inflation at 8 to 10 percent, a uh, fixed income sort of return in the 7 percent bracket will not definitely help uh, the investor. So what is important is knowing clarity on the goals because the clarity on goals can actually give you and define your time horizon. And once your time horizon is set, then you can actually decide that, okay, this is the percentage allocation which goes to equity. This is the percentage allocation which goes to fixed income. And then within that, one can decide whether I want to take a, a you know, passive approach, an active approach, which fund to pick. But I think without clarity on the investment horizon, it is a very, very difficult to uh, you know, decide where and how to invest. But somebody who's looking to invest today and is a long-term investor, I don't think should think twice. Uh, definitely start with an SIP and equity funds for your long-term portfolios. Uh, on the fixed income side, I think it'll still look good. And it's a good time to park even as lump sum. Uh, as interest rates uh, probably, uh, you know, they peaked uh, already, uh, RBI has uh, pressed the pause button. So if going forward, we see inflation cooling and, uh, you know, interest rates going down, definitely there would be a boost in the fixed income space as well. Okay, so in that case, when we are talking about a certain period of time when you have to go ahead and invest, uh, which category to choose, what are the factors to consider when you pick a fund house and a fund also? Is it the AUM, the expense ratio, the fund manager? Is that something that needs to be considered or the category works? Uh, so, Sonal, I think, uh, yes, uh, a credible fund house is very important. We have, I think, uh, you know, we have increasing number of AMCs joining the market space, which is good. Competition is good for the markets. But I think if you are a beginner, start with a credible AMC. And that is why, that is because the, 
you can actually see how the equity funds from the fund house have performed during different market cycles. So you have some data there, though, all, uh, you know, of course, what has happened in the past may not be replicated in the future, but I think it gives a uh, decent guidance on how the funds are managed. Second, uh, somebody is building now uh, his or her portfolio should definitely look at the different investment styles. So even if I'm looking uh, to create a very basic portfolio for myself, where I'm looking at a large cap, a mid cap and a small cap fund, I would want inclusion of different investment styles. I think that is important. What we've seen, the, uh, what we've seen in the last one and a half years was, you know, uh, uh, pick up in the value uh, investing uh, growth uh, approach really didn't work. So I think different market periods, uh, sort of uh, different approaches work. And I think that is where a combination is good. Other than that, I think uh, inclusion of different market caps is important. So if you're going and investing in a flexi cap fund and a large cap fund, it may actually lead to a lot of duplication in your portfolio. Uh, there is you know, duplication as high as 75% sometimes in the large cap and the flexi cap funds from the same fund house. So I think to keep that low, it's good to uh, move across the uh, market cap space. And I think, again, the decision has to be, and the core is suitability according to your goals, because uh, once you know that this is my goal, uh, you know, a portfolio can be created with inclusion of basic categories, such as large cap, mid cap, small cap, which can create your core, and then maybe uh, another one or two categories to top it up as a, a satellite portfolio. Okay, got that. Uh, Prableen, you know, a lot of people, when they write into us, sometimes they go through their portfolio and they just have tens of schemes, right? They write in with 30, 40 schemes because they don't know where to invest. So they've just put a little bit of money everywhere. It could be as little as 2000 rupees in a scheme. What would you suggest is a good number of schemes to have? Because, you know, like you were mentioning, there's a lot of duplication. Even in these cases, we see so much overlap. So what do you think is a good number of schemes to have uh, in your mutual fund portfolio? So, Pavitra, I've seen as high as uh, more than 100 schemes in an investor's portfolio. The second highest, what I saw, was about 88 schemes. So, what becomes so difficult is how do you take an exit call? There is so much of management which is involved, so many you know uh, tax-related uh, aspects which start to come. So, it is definitely important to, when you're building your portfolio, if you're unsure, please take guidance. If you uh, can do it yourself, then I think start with three to four schemes that's good enough for majority investors in the equity space, uh, a large cap fund, a mid cap fund and a small cap, small cap only if you have a longish horizon. So what we saw, you know, the data that I shared earlier, that show that, you know, five is like sort of the critical time period, five years to be in the markets because you have to have completion of the cycles. So only if you have a long time period, please invest in mid and small caps. So, but I think these three core strategies can be, a, a, you know, good inclusion and along with that, uh, maybe some exposure outside India and, to cater to near-term and uh, medium-term goals, I think inclusion of one to two debt funds uh, can be good as well. 100 schemes in a portfolio, just wrapping my head around that, Prableen. But it's stressful uh, to think about, right? <laughs> I'm right? sure, I'm sure. So that's why we have experts in the show who talk yeah. about how you can have a balanced portfolio as well, right? Prableen, it's an interesting chat. We'll do one thing, we'll slip into a quick break and the other side, we'll continue our discussion on how to build your MF portfolio at such a point in time. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Mutual Fund Corner on CNBC TV 18. We still have with us Prableen Bajpai. We're talking all about creating a mutual fund portfolio. Um, you know, the ideal question or the question that everyone asks the first time they're investing is what would the equity debt split be? And what would it be for a high, medium or low risk profile? I know it's very individualistic, the answer. But if we compare them and if we put them in different baskets, what would you recommend? Right, Sonal, uh, asset allocation is the foundation of uh, any good portfolio because that is what uh, governs the returns. Uh, and uh, it's good to have that clarity in mind what is the percentage which goes into fixed income and equities. So I think uh, one way to look at it for somebody who's uh, who doesn't have a high risk, uh, you know, appetite and is looking to take a conservative approach, uh, can have about somewhere between 15 to 40 percent in um, equities. I know 40 percent is slightly on the higher side, but depending on the goals that that person may have, he or she may need to stretch to that level uh, to be in equities. For somebody who's a moderate risk taker can have 40 to 60% in equities, a rest in fixed income, 
and usually uh, 70 percent and above in equities is what how we define a high risk uh, individual in the stock markets uh, now this is one way of uh, you know giving a percentage allocation the other way is of course you know uh, you look at your age and uh, 100 minus your age is what should go into equities and if you are a conservative investor probably you can do a up down of 10 to 20 percent there uh, likewise for a moderate and high risk investor uh, but sonal have uh, you know uh, while we have these broader principles of what is the percentage allocation very few people actually follow it and what is important is that uh, you know, if you're having an equity portfolio, you have to, uh, you know, uh, sort of incrementally, once you're used to how the stock markets are moving, uh, even as a low risk investor, the person may actually get tuned and can have a higher risk appetite going forward. So reviewing that also becomes very uh, crucial because your own risk appetite is also, I think, which changes with time.